We've already looked at habit in detail last week and seen how it can be used methodologically in a sort of phenomenological reflection where we not only rehabituate our consciousness, but we find within habit the prime example of a being that is not reducible to either object or consciousness. It's an intermixing of the two, inseparable uh, union between soul and body. Merleau-Ponty takes this tradition up from Ravisson and from Bergson, and what he does, rather than criticizing anything specifically, he tries to evolve and further develop the metaphors that they use. And one of the first ones he brings up, and one that really defines this entire section that we read, is the one pulled from Bergson, when Bergson is referring to Ravisson's philosophy, and in particular, the importance of habit in Ravisson's philosophy. He says that habit is the fossilized residue of a spiritual activity. And what this means is that there was spirit, there was intelligence and understanding at work when the habit was being formed. The habit comes about by organizing our activity and making sense of the world in a new way. But once that habit has been created, once it has been instituted, the intelligence, the spiritual side of it, retreats or it withdraws. And all that's left is something inert, this mechanism that is outside of our will and that we cannot just overcome by simply shutting it off or getting rid of it. It's something that sort of haunts us. Um, and it is the bedrock of our being, our embodied being in the world. Our habits are this fossilized re residue of a spiritual activity. And Merleau-Ponty takes up this description, although he wants to evolve it and improve upon it, and he does so in a really interesting way. So if we take this idea of spiritual activity, that dimension of it, he wants to go a little bit further and speak of a consecration. And consecration is an act which imbues something with sacred value. It's this act where we imbue physical things with a higher spiritual dimension to them. And he's going to show us how that is an essential aspect of all habit. And it's especially important to the expressivity inherent within habit and our habituation to the world. And another really key thing is this idea of sedimentation, right? And this connects to the idea of fossil, the fossilized residue. So he's building here on Bergson's analogy, not only is habit a fossilized residue, but these fossils are building up on one another and set in a layers of sedimentation building and building to create our habit body to create our bodies being in the world and the lived body's way of engaging with the world and taking the world up and making sense of the world now he wants to question some of this overly reductive view that Bergson gives us that habit is a is a fossilized residue and therefore it is something that we can dissociate from the spiritual activity and that's what Merleau-Ponty is really questioning here and it's already been questioned in the work of Ravisson and in some sense Bergson himself leaves that space open when Merleau-Ponty brings this up, this is on page 143, he says, Must we thus place an act of the understanding at the origin of the habit that would first organize the habit's elements only to later withdraw from it? And there he cites directly this passage from Bergson. So is it the case that understanding somehow, you know, coming down from above is 
engaged in the activity of producing habit and then withdraws from habit and habit is really just this effect left over in the body that is semi-detached from our autonomy and from our will and from who we are. And he wants to question this and in his questioning of this, he's going to come up with a more detailed, a richer description of habit that doesn't erase this aspect of its fossilization, right? Because he retains that in the idea of sedimentation, but brings in a deeper spiritual activity that is part of habituation, which he is calling consecration. And so we're going to work to that. So he gives this example, and this example comes directly from Bergson in Time and Free Will. It's the example of learning a dance. And here we should think of these very like formulaic dances that were big in French aristocratic culture, where you had to learn all of the dance moves in order to engage in it fluidly. It's not something that you could just go to and kind of pick up as you go. Um, you kind of had to memorize the entire dance beforehand. And in memorizing it, you're sort of analyzing every single movement that it takes. And you're using that as a guide to adopt the attitude that that dance requires and eventually to do it as second nature to kind of immersively in a flow state engage in the dance without thinking about it at all, right? So we move from understanding and concept and design and analysis to being able to do it as second nature. And that second nature aspect of it as just being able to do it is the kind of fossilized residue of that spiritual activity. And Bergson, when he analyzes this, talks about the feeling of grace. And he says that grace is the engagement of spirit with the body when it moves in ways that are graceful. But when, when dancing, those movements are fluid and continuous and following that program to a T, right? The graceful dancer doing the waltz or whatever dance is the one who does it perfectly, who doesn't overdo any of them, doesn't underdo any of the moves, and moves from one to the next in an effort, almost effortless uh, smoothness and continuity of movements. But Merleau-Ponty focuses on the fact that it's not enough to simply arrange all of these movements abstractly in our mind. No, we actually have to engage with them with our body and our body needs to understand them and grasp them in themselves, not mediated by our ideas and our concepts. And that's exactly how when we engage in the dance, all of that mental conceptual aspect completely falls away. And yet we have the sense of the dance. We have immediately and more profoundly the sense of that dance by living it and by doing it. He says on page 144, in order for the new dance to integrate particular elements of general motricity, it must first have to receive, it must first have received, so to speak, a motor consecration. And this motor consecration is imbuing these movements with a certain significance, a kind of reverence and affection is formed where the body almost loves these movements and that intimate love and affection and reverence for these movements orders and orients its ability to understand them in a lived way rather than as a thought about them. The acquisition of this habit, he says, is surely the grasping of a signification, but it's specifically a motor grasping of a motor signification. And he expands on this with a few examples. One is a hat that has a feather in it, right? If you're wearing a feather in your hat, you need to habituate yourself, familiarize yourself with its height, 
how to avoid hitting it on a light or a doorway. And this extension of our body by the hat is incorporated into the living body and becomes part of our familiarity and our gestural and behavioral uh, comportment, right? This is the idea of the motor schema. We adapt this new aspect of our body into our body and it becomes an extension of the body. And this applies also in the case of driving a car. He gives this example where there's no need to stop and use our judgment and measurement and things like that in order to gauge how big the lane is. Um, we have an intuitive sense of that and we are able to calculate exactly how to drive through that space, calculate it without any explicit act of judgment coming in, without thetic consciousness coming in, without using a kind of diagram or anything like that. And this is also evident in a person using a cane. The cane is not uh, something that they have to calculate the distances with or translate the signals that they feel in their hands into some external image of the thing out there. The cane integrates into the system of the body and becomes an extension of the body itself. And of course, the cane is moving, so it's something motor, but it's also sensory. It's immediately showing the person what is around them. So the sensory motor circuit are very closely intertwined and the cane itself becomes an extension of the motor schema by being engaged in the world directly. He says, to habituate oneself to a hat, an automobile, or a cane is to take up residence in them, or inversely, to make them participate within the vol voluminosity of one's own body. Habit expresses the power we have of dilating our being in the world or of altering our existence through incorporating new instruments. And what this means is that when we acquire a new habit, it's not as if we have simply taken on a new reflex. But instead, we have opened up a new way of looking at the world. We have reorganized our existence such that we can engage with existence in a new way we didn't have access to or understanding of prior to that habituation. And this is where we start to come to this idea of consecration. This comes from a really interesting and insightful example that Merleau-Ponty gives us of an organist who plays on a new organ for the first time. Now we really have to think about what this entails because if you've never encountered a church organ or if you don't know its specifications, they're highly complex, right? And there's multiple layers of what's going on here that are important. You know, on the one hand, the organist is able to do something incredibly complex. There are oftentimes four keyboards for their hands that they switch between. And there is a pedal board and they use both of their feet to access those pedals. So oftentimes they will be playing a bass line with their feet, a rhythm line with one of their hands and a melody line on another keyboard with another hand. And that's already an incredible feat of coordination and you know, it's as if one person is four people. It's incredible. Or more than four people. But there's another level to this example that is really important for the idea of consecration. So one of the things about a organ is that it has many different sounds available to it. And these are called stops. The stop is a lever that the organist will pull in order to turn on a certain sound or turn it off. And you can think an organ has some sounds which imitate flutes. It has some that imitate strings, some that imitate trumpets, some that imitate woodwinds, 
and then it has settings that incorporate all of them. And each one of these stops, each one of these settings, each one of these voices, has a different feel to it. It has a different mood, it has a different energy level. If you play a melody with the trumpet sound on, it's going to sound a bit more lively, a bit more intense, versus the flute setting, which is much softer and more docile and more soothing. And then if you pull all of them, you get the plenum of all the sounds at once, and it's very intense. Just like an uh, orchestra, you've got lots of families of sound here. That orchestra has this, the woodwinds, and so does an organ, a clarinet, French horn, You've got all the reeds of the orchestra, you've got the brass section of the orchestra, flutes of the organ, lovely flute sounds, but then you've got the great string section of the organ. These strings are from 1914, the, the Skinner organ. of strings and you're always changing throughout what part of the orchestra all the time yeah you're always changing the sounds because you want the organ to be as expressive as possible that's why it's great to uh, support a thousand people singing their hearts out because the organ can can support them and make them sound better what exactly do these buttons do and, and these oh there's even more knobs than i thought right 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 there's knobs for the left foot for and, the right foot and you just have the muscle memory to Later. Yeah, yeah, you just learn where all these things are. Yeah. Each one of those has its own unique characteristics and feel to it. Now, when you go from an organ in France to an organ in Germany, very likely the inventor in each of those instances is either French or German and uses a totally different layout. Sometimes these are very different, especially if you think of someone in, you know, the 19th century going to use an organ from the 14th or 15th century, right? A really old organ. It still has a bunch of different stops. It has a bunch of different voices and things are laid out slightly different. And so the organist has some sense of what they want to play, but the way in which they access that on the new organ is going to be very different. You know, the stops are going to be placed in a different location, but that's not all. They could be slightly different stops. Instead of having a flute sounding one, you have something that sounds like, you know, clarinets, and maybe that's good enough, you know, for the part that you intended to play there on the flutes, you can use the clarinets instead, right? It, it, it can substitute for them in that situation. So when the organist learns how to use the new organ, they need to learn how to pull, not just for locating some object in space, but for creating a kind of habitual type of movement which accesses something expressive a sound an emotion a attitude so the the stops actually represent spatialization of certain moods and attitudes certain what merleau-ponty calls affective vectors reaching here versus reaching there is not two points in space understood geometrically it's two different aesthetic feels it's two different affective states it's two different ways of being in the world of being expressive not simply geometrical locations he says on page 147 in the rehearsal of the organist the gestures in rehearsal are in fact gestures of consecration. They put forth affective vectors, they discover emotional sources, and they create an expressive space 
just as the gesture of the auger defines the templum. And here, a little further down, he continues, the principal regions of my body are consecrated to actions and the parts of my body participate in their value and the question as to why common sense places the seat of thought in the hand is the same as the question of how the organist distributes musical significations in the space of the organ. The body actually learns and picks up certain vectors of intentionality here. The consecration of something means that that thing now appears sacred and holy, and we regard it with a kind of reverence and affection, right? And there's a particular affection that the organist has for the softness of the uh, flutes, right? And when the organist is improvising in between songs, right, as they do in church or something like that, the organist knows what they want to express, and they have a sort of affection for that particular way of expressing the sounds that is appropriate to that moment. And so they have this kind of affective relationship and a kind of reverence for the expressiveness that they are intending to produce. And so when they habituate themselves to grabbing the stop where it is, what they're actually habituating, what they've instituted, is a kind of consecration. This is imbued with a kind of orientation towards that emotional state or that signification, that deep level of significance and meaning. As he says, again on page 147, the entire problem of habit here is to determine how the musical signification of the gesture can be condensed into a certain locality to the extent that by entirely giving himself over to the music, the organist reaches for precisely the stop and the pedal that will actualize it. This is exactly what I was just saying. In the flow of being expressive, the organist grabs for what immediately uh, actualizes the type of expression, expression that they are looking for. If they are going from one part to the next, and in that next part, the intensity needs to go up, they need to be able to, without thinking about it, immediately grab and pull that lever and keep playing. And when it's winding down and becoming more docile and softening, again, they need to be able to immediately be habituated to an expressiveness that is at their hands, and it's a knowledge that is in their hands, as he says time and again in this chapter. Not only is this consecration instituting a certain significance, a certain reverence, a sort of orientation and affective value, it's also comparable to the initiation into a mystery, right? When we become initiated to a mystery, we gain access to something that could not have made sense prior to that process of initiation. Again, this is a kind of spiritual enlightenment that is already there within habit in our engagement with the world. When we are habituated to a type of expression, say it's, again, learning a musical instrument, the consecration of that sacredness, right, is, on the other hand, an initiation to a mystery. It's the opening up of that way of understanding and that way of seeing and that way of experiencing that we didn't know beforehand, that our ways of organizing our life couldn't have explained. And it breaches a threshold which we did not have access to beforehand. And taking this back to the example of dancing, uh, this idea comes partially from Leibniz, who says that when we become habituated to a new activity, we aren't simply rearranging parts that we already had. So he looks at the example of swimming. 
and says that swimming is not merely a rearrangement of prior habits. So we have the ability to walk and we have the ability to move our arms. When we learn to swim, we don't simply combine walking and arm movement to create swimming. We have to completely reintegrate our body schema. We have to completely modulate our body's way of engaging with the world. And when we do that, we consecrate a sort of orientation. We institute a new way of making sense of the world, which is the world of swimming, right? The way that we move our bodies and the way that we coordinate our movements in water is entirely engaged and intertwined with that milieu, with that region of our movement. And it really requires a global reintegration of our body schema. Our body schema is this kind of background of all of our sedimented habits. It's everything we've learned to do and our body has learned to understand. Um, it's all of our dexterity, but it also goes beyond that. And it reintegrates that in a new way that was not simply the juxtaposition of one or two of our prior habits together. It's a global reintegration of them. <laughs>